Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I know it's been a challenging day for people to get to the museum, but we're excited for this really spectacular day of programming. Um, I'm Sophia Marie Silicus. I'm one of the organizers of this exhibition, Views International. And I want to thank my colleagues, Lindsay Burfan, Catherine Grau, and Adrian Cotin for organizing this today. And also to let you know that we're um, doing offering transcription services today um, through card services and uh, in English and then um, in Spanish through Google Translate. Um, this series of talks was inspired by the framework for Queens International 2018, looking at the ways knowledge is produced and recorded in institutions like libraries and museums. In this case, asking questions about what is omitted, ignored, or erased, and the various degrees of visibility of these types of exclusion. We have three discussions exploring these issues, touching on literature, art, and the digital sphere. And um, we have a slight change from the first conversation. Um, artist Christina Freeman, whose project of the Archive, um, in part inspired this day, will be joining um, representatives from the National Coalition Against Censorship, Nora Pellicari, and Abed Mitchell. Thank you. Hi. So this conversation is going to be a little bit um, freewheeling because we were unprepared for this to be the group. Um, but maybe Christina, you can start by talking to us a little bit about the Ultraviolet Archive and then we can talk about how it ties into what we do at NCC. Sure. Um, so originally I was really interested in um, creating space for uh, creative works and artists that had a risk of being invisible to the public eye. Um, and it surprised me that there was no government institution, there's no particular body, there's no location where you can go if you want to see and touch and read and experience all of these artworks or books, music, and films um, that have been banned or censored or face this type of kind of uh, problematic issue. And so then I decided I wanted to temporarily make that space, and um, as I've done more and more research, it's been overwhelming to find out how many different challenges artists face, and uh, how it's sort of an endless uh, research project that keeps expanding. But it's been really helpful to get information from NCAC and also from Free News to start my, my research. Um. And, I mean, to that end, so many of the books that you have out there are books that I work to defend. Um, I coordinate NCAC's Youth uh, Free Expression Program, and um, we constantly receive reports of challenges in schools and libraries to books like, uh, like the ones you have displayed there, um, either because of the most, the most challenged books often are because they feature LGBTQ content or themes, um, or discuss race or um, issues of social injustice that um, that parents who are the most likely challenged books aren't ready to talk about. With, with their, Can you speak a little bit closer? Oh, thank you. Sorry, um, aren't ready to talk about with their youth. And I was, I was just saying that so many of those books displayed out there are books that we work to defend from censorship in schools and libraries, um, but also about 80% of challenges, an estimated 80% don't get reported. So even even though you know the research that you've done shows there's so, there so many incidents of censorship that haven't been documented, there's so many more that you know um, that that we don't hear about too because they just don't get reported. Can you talk a little bit about, because you know, you work closely with teachers and school administrators and things like that in um, dealing with these challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the forces that would prevent a challenge from going reported? Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, teachers risk losing their jobs um, and, and librarians risk losing their jobs when books are challenged. Um, administrators hate upsetting parents, that's the last thing that they want to do is have a difficult exchange interaction with a parent, and so often um, the educator gets the point, right? And um, what happens is they just, 
in a lot of cases, administrators will pull the book or pull whatever material um, is, is offensive without actually having a, a discussion about it or inviting educators to weigh in on the educational merits of it. Um, but also we've had to defend or advise um, educators and librarians who were after the challenge, dealing with you know the retaliatory exhibit and, and um, losing their jobs or, or things with um, disciplinary actions. Um, and long term, that means that teachers are less likely to introduce books they feel would offend, less likely to talk about issues they think would um, would raise um, eyebrows, and, and so there's self censorship. I think that's the most um, pervasive and also damaging uh, consequence of censorship or book challenges. So, um, to push this in a lot, like maybe slightly more uncomfortable place, um, you know, it's very uh, tempting to say that all of these book challenges come from, say, like particularly conservative households that don't want their kids learning about LGBTQ themes or they don't want their kids, you know, reading vulgar language or something. Um, but I think in reality, we also see, particularly in the last decade or so, an uptick in challenges from particularly progressive parents who um, are concerned about their kids, you know, encountering historically accurate, racially violent language um, in books that are in the canon. And, you know, we get a lot of challenges from that place as well, which can be sort of emotionally harder to defend because they seem to be coming from a, such a good, strong, well-meaning place, but it is still asking for censorship. And so how do you kind of think about that yeah. and approach that? I mean, um, it's, the struggle is, is that, you know, um, Especially for me, also as a black woman, it can be difficult um, to confront or defend um, texts that parents see as harmful to their kids. It comes from a protective place. Um, but there's also a lack of, I think, there's a fear um, that their children, that the school system isn't equipped to address these topics in a way that they feel um, their, their students need or their, their children need um, in an affirming way. Um, in a pro-black way, um, and so there, I think, needs to be more um, engagement of parents by um, by schools um, and 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 by teachers. There need to be more conversations um, between parents, their, their students, or their, their children, and educators about um, the the purpose of teaching to kill a mockingbird. What are we teaching it in the context of? Um, are we are we discussing what contemporary America looks like, what racism in contemporary America um, looks like, and how you are going to confront and, and interact with your experiences with race in this community. And um, I think that's, that helps parents um, feel more confident that, um, that, their child is, that their child is being seen as a priority, that their child is being taught in the best interest of their child and not um, to perpetuate um, systems that the big experiences are, are harmful, are harmful to, you know, to, black, to black lives. I'm curious on, so much louder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious in terms of like location when we talk about removing books from the library or even like I was teaching at Haverford College and they had a closet where the art books that were too explicit were locked away. You had to go ask the librarian to unlock that closet if you wanted to check out you know, Maple Thorpe or something like that. Um, and in terms of like NCAC, um, is there kind of a, a best practices in like physically where do you put those works? Or for example, in like one of the Brooklyn libraries, I know that like Tin Tin on Congo was asked to be put in a back room. And so, um, it makes sense that you don't want to perpetuate stereotypes, you don't want something to be in the world without context when it needs proper context. So what do you do, where do you put it? Um, that's an interesting question and it ties into, so at NCAC we work with um, youth and, and books, but we also have an arts advocacy program and we work with um, art censorship as well. 
And um, this ties very much into uh, when we work with curators and um, cultural institutions in terms of labeling and contextualizing difficult work um, without prejudicing the audience. Because if you tell someone it's going to be upsetting, it's going to be upsetting. Right? So how you create those labels and those spaces without making the viewer want to avoid it or or influencing how they approach it, right? Like you're telling them how it's going to make them feel before they see it. Um, so it's it's difficult. There's no kind of correct, I suppose. Um, part of it when it comes to schools and libraries is, um, is it a country school, is it a middle school, is it a high school? Like that makes a difference. Um, how you label things, um, what you allow access to at different ages, um, whether it requires parental permission um, to say, check out a Judy Bloom book if you're under 13, which it shouldn't require. But, um, you know, that is something that, that libraries and schools would tend to do is resort to things like you need a special permission slip to check out a certain book or to read a certain book. Um, at this point, most schools provide, say, the syllabus for the entire year or semester to parents beforehand with the idea of heading off these kinds of challenges before the school year starts, because it's much more disruptive, right, when a book is already being taught to have a parent come in and say, we demand you stop teaching this book, then if in August they say, we don't want you to teach this book, right? Um, we also support the idea of alternative assignments. So um, if a parent doesn't want their student to read to go on the word, or George, or you know, one of the many, many books that get pulled for uh, LGBTQ names. Um, if a parent doesn't want their student to read that book, then their student doesn't have to read that book. The teacher will provide an alternative assignment. But they don't get to decide what the rest of the class reads, right? If that's a heckler's veto, and we're, we're not uh, interested in supporting that, right? You don't get to decide what everyone else's student gets access to the same way you don't get to decide how everyone encounters art in the museum. You get to decide how you encounter it. And so it's providing ways, context, labels, putting potentially disturbing work, maybe not in this room, but in that room, right? So that you don't have to walk through a door to get to it, as opposed to it being the first thing you confront when you walk in a room. But being thoughtful about that without being prejudicial about that is a very delicate balance, but it's really worthwhile. And I mean, to that same, we've seen so many arise and challenges um, to library content, particularly around uh, Jude <laughs> Pride displays. Um, there have been court cases, like actual um, litigation claims filed in federal court that Pride display, uh, book displays are um, violate um, religious or Christian community members have fund a First Amendment right to um, exercise their belief because it's, it's using taxpayer dollars to impose um, a gay agenda or to, to, to impose um, a, a different belief onto them. And I, I mean, we've responded on each of those cases, of course, to defend um, the right to display LGBTQ themes. We've actually hosted our own programs with um, Drag Queen Story Hour at Brooklyn Public Library. Um, to make that point, you know, um, clearly and you know, resoundingly. Um, but I think it's it's part of it's just another um, part of the problem. This fear of engaging um, topics that make us uncomfortable, and instead reacting by trying to silence or erase the experience of um, diverse voices and diverse members of the community. Um, so I mean, that's another. Well, because, I mean, you can certainly look at the um, sort of absence of diverse voices or the underrepresentation of certain voices as its own form of censorship. Absolutely, 100%. And so we are extremely supportive of the inclusion of diverse voices and the increased exposure of underrepresented voices. But we have to find ways to do it without censoring, right? We have to find ways to do it without disallowing existing voices or dominant voices. For example, there's a difference between not teaching To Kill a Mockingbird. You can choose a different novel. You don't have to teach To Kill a Mockingbird. We're not insisting that you do. But when a school district says teachers are not allowed to teach 
Toronto Hockey, where that's a different situation, and that's a problem, right? Because what if that teacher would have taught it really well? What if that teacher had a really good project and the right class, and that was what her students needed to hear, and she was going to teach it in a really nuanced 2018 way, you know? Like, she was going to teach it right, but she's not allowed to. You know, that sentence to the teacher, and it prevents those students from accessing work, which, if they're going to go on to study English literature in college, they probably need to have read the American Canon. So, you know, there's a lot of problems there. It's a different, it's a different thing. Not teaching it versus not being allowed to teach it is very different. And we need to navigate that in sort of a, it's, an, it's a complicated sort of place to be. I've been thinking about both of you a lot um, when writing white walling. Am I like shouting out to you? Not at all. Not. Okay. Um, one of the things that listening to the last panel, I'm really struck by, and, and what really formed the premise of um, the work that I've been doing, is the way in which we talk about freedom of speech as a kind of foundational, fundamental, democratic value, but the ways in which we often overlook the way freedom of speech is unequally distributed um, in the U.S. And one of the things that really struck me over the course of reading about and researching and talking to you and many people in, in your art world um, over the course of of the last year and a half or so is that uh, often there were there were artists, artist groups, curators, administrators, <laughs> um, you know, uh, activists in the art world who were trying, who were doing two things simultaneously. One was protesting, challenging existing institutions about their uh, lack of space, lack of inclusion of certain communities, and at the same time trying to make new spaces available for um, artists and other cultural figures to uh, do their work. But that on the protest side, um, both of you have, over the course of your careers as protesters, been accused of censorship. That protesting, for example, against artist space in the late 70s, I'm sorry, I should have warned you in advance, I was going to bring that up, but still. Um, art, the artist space was protested in the late 70s uh, by a group of artists and activists who objected to the fact that a young white artist was allowed to put up a show that used in its title the most incendiary racial epithet in the English language um, for no <coughs> good reason. For no reason, for it in a completely arbitrary way. And uh, Linda and Janet were both on the front lines of a very consequential protest during which you were both accused of being censored. Censors, right? And so I'm sort of I'm interested in I'm, I'm interested in both halves. I'm interested in your work as your your activities as protesters, but also your roles as makers of space, alternative spaces, um, spaces that uh, allowed for a kind of inclusion that didn't exist. Um, and at the same time, you're both being very creative in, in those. Um, in your own practices as well. So there's a lot. <laughs> so who wants to start? I'm going to let you know. I'm going to go first and, and yes, because I'm going to say something. We didn't care. We had our own world to some degree. And we made art for ourselves in conjunction in response to the artists that we were in contact with. And because of Linda's eye, she saw art made by a bunch of different kind of people, and we all came together and made art. And show, show did, and it's yours. 
In those few seconds, mm -hmm. you have the essence of my and Janet's relationship. <laughs> Just want you to know that was an intimate moment. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, first off, everything that you said is so layered that we could probably spend all afternoon. Yeah. All right, so I am going to try to parse out the various layers of what you somewhat combine in a way that I actually want to unpack. Okay. All right. So I think there's a difference between freedom of speech and exposure of speech. So there's that. Um, and most of what many of us have dealt with and many of us continue to deal with is the exposure, the microphone, the walls where the public space where people can see creative expression, et cetera, versus not being able to do it. So those closer, and I would say just what Midtown falls into that. It wasn't that artists weren't making work, it was that their work wasn't being exposed, and that exclusion created a type of censorship. So there's not one censorship, there are very different types of censorship. So, so that's one. Um, I would never have considered and rejected it at that time that the protest of art space, and prior to that, the Whitney Museum, uh, and the work of Vito Kanchi and um, Dennis Oppenheim, and I think it was the 1977 Biennial, which were racially offensive pieces, I mean, just racially offensive pieces. And I wish I could get my hands on the Vito Kanchi, you can't even find that piece anymore. Um, I don't even think they even put it in his, his, his list of lists. Yeah, I mean, it works. It's, it's really how that has it disappeared. Um, but the, those, that the protest was about the exclusion of other expressions of work on the same platform with those artists. The, the, the protest at Art Space was, if you're gonna show this turkey, right, to the exclusion of showing folks who can represent themselves, there's something wrong with that. So we were actually protesting, quote unquote, a form of censorship that, that is, is being censored out of the system. Right, than his ability to use the inward. There, there was a great, I mean, one of my favorite um, documents that I came across when I was researching the artist space thing was Janet's letter to the New York State Council of the Arts, or no, I'm sorry, to the um, director of artist space. And he wrote in it that when you first saw the, the title of the show, um, your first thought was, can it actually be possible that artist space is showing a black artist? Because your assumption was no one but a black artist would dare to use that word in the title of the show, and artist space showing a black artist would be almost unthinkable. Well, and also I thought that they were examining, that the show would be an examination of the work, you know, the implications and just, it's fraud. So, oh good, okay. this is going to show that I'll cover a number of, of, of um, topics and just have some range. And then I found out that the reason for the name was he got charcoal on his hands. And that's why he thought of calling it that. And I ran up, up town to just a little big town, and as Linda put it, I was babbling. It took, she had, it took a while <laughs> to, for me to calm down. So you know. everyone gets that, right? Like, the, his arms got black when he was making the drawings. So that's why he decided to call them like the, the end the end drawings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, but two, the, the, the idea, the idea of making decisions like that in a in, in a uh, kind of a, an I, not, well, an isolated or, or uh, an, an, an environment where you don't include the, the people that who, who are the subject who in, you know in, in essence are the subject of the work you don't have them if you don't have different kinds of people around or, or uh, an, uh, group of people if if you if if we, if people if the situation isn't diverse, then you make you can and do make 
very bad decisions based on that kind of, based on our isolation. So, um, I mean, the, the thing about us, just about Midtown, I'm not caring. When uh, I use that in, 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 the, in the context that we got to make art, we got to show art. We, I mean, we didn't sell much of it, but the idea of being in a creative environment and then being in a vibrant creative environment, I think meant, more, meant a lot to me still does. And I think it meant a lot to the people who were involved in it. Could, we, could you talk a little bit about Jam and, yeah. important to talk about is the ways in which, you know, I wrote a book on the history of black protest against institutions, but the parallel story is the way in which all of the artists who were involved in these protests were creating other spaces. They were creating the worlds they wanted to see, essentially, right? At the same time as they were talking about and putting issues on the table like, Artist Space is a publicly funded institution. We're also paying those taxes, and so why aren't we being acknowledged as part of the audience, right, that comes into these spaces? So making those very important points, but at the same time, creating these other platforms, right, for, for, for you and, and your peers to do the work that needed to be done, that you needed to do and you needed to show and you needed to have the world. So I, you know, Jam is like one of the most significant of those spaces and a very important space in New York. So I was just hoping you would talk about it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that um, I have, to, and I've said this a thousand times, but I, and I'll say it again. The reason Jam came about was that when it's, it's, it's natural when you're excluded from something to spend a lot of time being focused on being excluded. Uh, and so uh, I, I was working at the Studio Museum and the Education Department, which also in, in, uh, made me responsible for the Artists in Residency program. And artists were coming to that program because of artists that were in it just to hang out, as well as the museum. And uh, often the conversation was about, they won't let us, they won't let us, they won't let us. And at some point, I just blurted out, well, fuck them. Sorry for the effort. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right? You know, okay, counts for it. So um, it, it, it's like, why don't we just do it ourselves? And and I think it's important to say that now today, because I think so much of our energy is spent on what someone is doing to us that we're not doing things. <laughs> as much as we should be doing for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and Jam was about us doing it ourselves. I, who, who wants to spend time dealing with those mofos? I'd rather be doing time figuring out how we're going to put together a space. And all of us did it. I mean, this was, this was a family affair. All of us created that space for ourselves and so other people could see what people were producing. Yeah. Um, 
And we weren't deferring to others to make it happen for us. Um, we were using that thing that I think we as human beings are getting more and more socialized out of, which is the very, and I say this a lot now, the very essence of all life. I don't care if it's amoeba, if it's a plant, I don't care if it's an animal or if it's a human being. The essence, the absolute essence quality of what is life is the ability to use what you have to create what you need. And we give over that to somebody else all the time now. We don't create our own food, we have somebody else to do it for us. We don't create our own clothes, we have somebody else to do it for us. We don't build our home, we have somebody else to do it for us. But we can say, yeah, modernization and technology and industrialization and blah, 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 blah. The fact of the matter is, we are not using that very essential thing that all other life continues to use. The squirrel does not ask a worm to get its nuts. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, you know what I'm saying? So why are we humans who are supposed to have all this brain power deferring over the responsibility for the very, very essential things we need to survive? Why are we not using what we have to create? So that's part of what jam was for me and continues to be and whatever I do. Well, that, that belief. I actually wanted to, you to make that connection between what you just said and what you're doing today. Yeah. Because, as well. But you can talk about Jam. There's pictures. So anyway, it's great to see this. I want, I'm glad that the folks can see the pictures, but what are the reasons? I like Another thing that we do <laughs> as human beings, and especially as human beings in the institution, is that we tend to lose the sense of continuum. It's like, this happens here, this time, this place, and this happens over here now. And the fact of the matter is, this happens over here now, wouldn't have happened without the energy that was over there. And we don't talk about it in the continuum, and there's young people and younger than me in the, in the room right now, and there's Chris over here. And one of the things I'm curious about is just what is the continuum? Did, did the continuum of JAM, which was this amazing space, which Dan described, with, uh, that had a lot of creative energy, um, it was family, um, we fought, we loved, we did everything. I have, why has that not kind of come about in, in, in that way? Because I feel like what you did is a model that needs to be replicated, but the question is, and, and, and you kind of kept it clean and pure in a certain way. It's not like you now have the board of directors of, you know, jam that you're dealing with. So why don't we see younger artists building the next generation of institutions? You know, I mean, uh, God, there's so many answers to that. Um, but let's, let's keep it to the art world and the cultural world. Um, I, I think we all saw it when we were around in the 80s. There was a shift. There was such a shift in the culture of the people who exhibited work, the collectors who were buying it, and the artists who were making it. Prior to the early 80s, artists were really dictating what they were making. That was my feeling. We, we, you know, everyone was making the work they wanted to create. In the 80s, and, and the artwork was small. The number of galleries, there was a small group of galleries. There was a small group of artist spaces. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of museums. Now you've got some museums and some people, but they're growing and growing private museums, right? They're growing and growing. And so, um, what shifted though, which I think started to undermine that kind of energy of why don't we just do this for ourselves. What shifted was the focus of who was driving and supporting creativity from people who were passionate about supporting it and people who were passionate about making works to people who were buying it. And that happened with Wall Street. That happened with the expansion of Wall Street. And so we had this new money class that had a lot of discretionary income, and you had art dealers who, at, I mean, when, when, when we opened Jam, if you went into any gallery in New York City, and as a potential collector and said uh, to the dealer, now it's gallerist, I'm sorry, to the gallerist, 
That change I will never understand because we were dealers. Anyway, see the calendars. Um, and, and, and you walked in and you said to the, to the galleries, you know, what piece on this wall, on these walls, is from an artist that's going to be worth more money three years from now or five years from now? Every dealer in New York City, every nonprofit artist that's in New York City, curator in New York City, director, whatever, would say, no, I actually can't talk to you about that. And we engaged that individual, those individuals, in a conversation that activated the way they saw what was on the walls. It was like, I can't talk to you about who's going to, who knows? But tell me, what, what do you like in this room? Well, I kind of like that thing over there with blue and pink. Well, let's talk about that. Why do you like that blue and with pink? We engage people in the process of seeing, which doesn't happen anymore. What we see when we walk even through museums, I mean, through museums, are our labels who tell us how to see what's on the wall. Which, it, it, we do not have unmediated experiences with art anymore. It's very hard to, to find them. That said, going back to what began to drive it, as the, as the art world itself became more and more attracted to the sparkles of money coming out of Wall Street, they wanted that money. And those folks were coming from Wall Street didn't want to see. Don't, don't tell me about seeing it. It's going to be worth something. And what has happened? We now live in a time and place where art is a commodity. The very essence and need we have for art has its purpose. The purpose of art is obliterated in the culture we have. And so, if you're an artist back in the mid 80s, when that market was growing, and then into the 90s, and it keeps growing because it's an insatiable market, it keeps growing, there's not enough art, which is why I think it's so quote unquote diverse now. And uh, artists of color, blacks and artists of color that have gone, who are starting to live off that, that wallet, need, need to be concerned about when that bubble bursts, where will you be then? Are you creating an infrastructure today that supports you when that bubble bursts? Because I truly believe there's, the inclusion today is, is a lack of supply. Too much demand, a lack of supply, let's bring in some more supply. And oh that we gosh. need to be worried about that. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> what else is there? It's all, it's all so less racist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 the, that's the gist of it, right? That all the talk about inclusion in the art world has not led to less racist institutions. No. No. Yeah. It's, it's also shallow. Um, has anyone seen the price of everything? All right, that is an artist. Those of you who haven't, there's a, a African um, a woman uh, whose name I, I can never remember. Her name. But she's a painter and she's getting a lot of attention and she has a gallery. And the, this one part of it focused on the fact that there were 12 people bid, bidding for one painting. There was a chance that it would shoot up to some un, uh, ridiculous price, the person would buy it, and then. Is that, it, it's, it's evidently a, a kind of syndrome. After they owned this thing that was too highly priced, they'd sell off her work and ruin her market. And that's how things like that work now. When things are commodified, they, they, the, all the things that we treasure in art, either as a maker or a consumer, just is, is a erase. So I want to go back, though, to, to the question, Chris, that to her that you sort of posed, because it seems to me that there's, like, yes, that, that there are a lot of young artists, especially, who are really, who have their focus on getting into the permanent alternatives, right, the established alternatives, and aren't, maybe there's less focus on creating sustainable, true alternatives spaces, right? Like not just pop-ups, but actually something that's sort of, that has a vision of, of at least a medium-term future. Um, so I want to, you know, there's two things that occur to me that are questions to ask, at least. One is, to what extent is it even, given the money that's not just poured into the art world, but poured into the world, 
and the, the very real problems of, say, real estate prices and rents and things like that, to what extent is the kind of very basic economic structure that would allow for someone to open a, an alternative space, right? Find a space in Manhattan or find a space in, in, in really even Brooklyn or Queens at this point um, and, and be able to, to run that space. To what extent is that just closed off in New York at least, right? And, you know, I think that's why we see more pop-ups, right? People taking advantage of space as it becomes available and then shutting down. So there's that, and, and so how do you work around that? And then the other question, I think, which is really interesting to me, because it ran through from the artist space protests and how people were addressing the problem of artist space as, a, as essentially a public institution that we also own, right? A public institution that people of color are, it's our institution too, and so why isn't it making, why isn't it, it acknowledging, um, especially black, uh, you know, artists, black viewers, right, in their programming? And then the Whitney Biennial controversy of, of 2017, where artists were saying, what does it do to a viewer, a, 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 a black viewer who's grown up um, having these photos of Emmett Till, um, these lin you know, photos of Emmett Till having been lynched, um, uh, uh, show, show up sort of uh, uncontextualized on the wall of the Whitney Biennial painted by a white artist. You know, what does it do to a, a black viewer at the Whitney Museum, essentially, I think, never having thought of that question as they put that painting on the wall, right? That there's, that there's an issue of, um, in both of those protests, people saying, this is our institution. We are the audience for your, this institution. And so why is it this institution serving us? Um, claiming parts of public culture that exist, um, in, not instead of, but in addition to creating alternative spaces. In other words, a question of why should we seed these public institutions just to create our alternative institutions. They've already got all the money. Why, why aren't we getting in on that? Why aren't we taking advantage of that? And the question perpetually then becomes, are those institutions, um, can we take them over? Can people take them over? Not, not we meaning necessarily even me being part of that coalition, but can um, peak activists take, take over, in a sense, change the, the situation, actually transform existing institutions that have the resources already, that have the infrastructure already, um, that could swallowed up all of that infrastructure, or is it just a losing game, and, and the only alternative is to blow it up and start again? Do you know what I mean? There has to be intent. Um, one of the most diverse organizations in, in the state is Lightwood. It's in Syracuse. And the reason it's diverse is that the director repeatedly pursued photographers of color went someplace, asked who knew, who was, and it has to be a mission. If it isn't a mission, you can always hide behind the fact that every exhibition space in this city is inundated with people trying to get their work shown. And you can, I heard, I heard, a, a, I heard a, a director of an organization that was very good when we brought up that fact uh, to that it wasn't that diverse, honestly said that we have too many, uh, too many, many artists applying for shows. Uh, you have to step, step back from that and say, we live in New York, we have to show everybody, or we just have to show everybody, we have to do better than we are. And if that isn't there, you know, the thing about activism, you know, that they'll hire a black person to deal with the artist of color and then need it as, a, you know, adjacent to, which is not, that does not satisfy 
with um, the or south of the problem. I think all the serious crisis of private and public, and that question of does the institution serve serve a public or is it or, or is it privately concerned is always going to be corny, which is why I think that some of our way forward, besides looking at the bones, our structure, things like jam, is also looking outside of the United States to places that don't have that same confusion. So when I look at alternative spaces throughout the world, places like San Art in Vietnam, raw material in Senegal, um, Timeti in Indonesia, all these places, these places that have long ago decided, no, that, that this is, there is no, uh, that, that, that our, our initiatives have to be for us and artist-led, and we can't count on a, a kind of government mandate that, 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 that don't have the same kind of confusion of private public spaces. I'm so excited by some of that work, uh, some, of, some of that, those moments when we say, uh, all the, all the quote-unquote public or pseudo-public institutions are agents of a kind of a, a hege hegemonic structure. Let's give those up and let them catch up. And that's the other thing that, you'll, that, that we're seeing. We see from, you know, the Jetson exhibition, I'll give you as an example, or any other exhibition, this idea that the, the institutions will catch up. We have to understand that they're going to catch up, that they're going to have to take a bunch of random scrappy dancers from the Lower East Side and say, oh, well, you're going to have that, you know, Thomas doing, put, yeah, Jetson. right, Jetson. Put that, that random piece of a, a rope that somebody once was like, that was the cheapest thing that they could do to make a dance, and now it's the moment. Like, that's, the, the institutions will catch up. We, we kind of have to understand that we're going to have to break that ground. Yeah, and, and I would just say, what you describe in terms of real estate is too expensive and all of those economic factors, we had those in 1974 when New York City was going bankrupt. And I go back to, I guess now, two things. Use what you have to create what you need and be resourceful enough to know what you have uh, and exploit it like a mofa. Um, so, you know, it jam was you know, we benefited from New York City being bankrupt in 1974 um, because the value of that 724 square foot space that we started in was renting at $1,000 at a market rate of $1,000. And the only way we got that space for $300, which also we didn't have, but down to $300 was saying to the landlord, we got a lot of empty space in this building, seems to me, $300 a month is better than nothing. That's how we got leads. I currently run a project um, of creating urban farms in communities where most people live on low incomes throughout New York City. We're farming on 12 sites right now, uh, about five acres of land. I don't have a dime, so I didn't buy that land. So what do you do? You say, okay, we do this. What's around that can be used? Whether well, it's the site of the Brooklyn Museum, it's got this little nice grassy wall. Wouldn't it be great to have food going on it? There's this vacant lot over here that's owned by this nonprofit across the street. You know, nonprofit across the street. Let's create, let's grow food on this. You don't have to just use what you have, create what you need, and take responsibility for it. I think you can do that no matter what time or place or economic condition we live in. You can make things, and then tie it right to Chris. I don't know why we don't question. It, it baffles me. I've never had a conversation with a curator, and I would be or an artist that has ever questioned these four white walls. These four white walls have been around for hundreds of years. Are we not tired of four white walls? Like, I do not understand why art has, has evolved to what it is now. And we have not questioned why we're still trying to create experiences for, for people to engage in, in these walls. Are these walls even relevant, relevant to what's being produced now? And it goes back to, you know, people creating spaces that are, are relevant and appropriate for the things, for their visions. And when do we start doing that in a field that's a creative field? I don't get it. 
popular. So, yeah, popular. I would go to go to Black Current, which you created, which was fabulous. We decided we were going to do this publication, and Janet came up with this idea. Talk about that. Keep going. Oh, I just wanted, I, I, I have a background in graphic design, more dark design, and, you know, the whole thing. I know how to do mechanical, real type of rubber cement and stuff. So, um, I wanted to do a magazine, and I uh, got this idea, and, and Linda said, go do it. So, we got some money, a little bit of money, and we invited artists. Uh, we couldn't pay him, so I made him jewelry. Uh, and they, <laughs> They um, we produced these. Uh, I think it was three, three, three of them, and then it, it, it morphed into B culture. But again, it was let's do this. Let's see. It, it's someone's idea. Um, let's see if we can make it work. The one of some of the first uh, slides that you saw on this were the in situ exhibition, and Lynn was it your idea? It, it, Linda had had this idea to put artists in the gallery, uh, four walls, and have them transform it. And we'll talk, talk about what happened. I mean, in a, a lot of great- That was insane. It, it, <laughs> those collaborations, Carlos is sitting over there too. You cannot leave Carlos out of this conversation. Uh, <laughs> he, he was with the New York State Arts Council, and he headed up the program there that we all went to get our money from if we were with the artist spaces. And uh, Car Carlos had to tolerate all of us uh, and the insanity we brought there. Uh, <laughs> but in situ is a situation, like Jane said, of bringing, so let's not put walls on the art on the walls. Let's just have artists create something. And, um, and so there was a lot of debate and argument. Uh, you know, don't be stepping on my square. This is my square. I, this is square. I want that corner. How are you going to take that corner? You just put my stuff down. Anyway, back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, we left the public in for the four weeks. And in the end, um, the public could come in and see the installed exhibition. And it was absolutely amazing and wonderful. And the exchange between artists, both uh, the arguments and the hugging, I think pushed everyone to work further than it was before they entered that gallery for that four, that four weeks. But anyway, here was another talk about a collaboration. I believe it was the first time that Three black male artists collaborated on a piece. I think in the history, I think it's in the U.S. I think really, I think in the U.S. How often does it happen? I don't know. But anyway, you talk about insanity. That was about a six-week insanity. But uh, and they all, we all did this in that chat. Do you remember that? <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> Well, I think that um, we're being given the signal, the high sign, so, um, but I just want to thank you all, and thank you for jumping in as well, but um, thank you, it's just wonderful to hear, and it's so gratifying to know that more and more people are kind of coming to know everything you achieved with JAM, um, you know, the more that we get to hear you all talk about it and all of the other work that you were doing. Janet is like one of these people that as I as I learn more and more I realize she was at the center. She was like the troublemaker at every major protest, intervention, new art space, whatever, over the course of she's like the zealot of um, of the art world. So um, we're we're investigating more. Thank you very much. what um, resources are available to us now um, and, and how we can imagine new spaces um, for creative uh, production and, and presentation is a great segue into our next conversation with Ryan Kuo, um, who um, is uh, an artist working mainly with software in the digital sphere and also um, collaborated with us on this website, which is the here. Uh, which is the exhibition website for Queens International 2018, in conversation with Nara Khan. Um, 
who uh, works at Rhizome and is a writer thinking about uh, digital art and uh, emerging technology. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and especially to talk to Ryan, who I feel like I've been in conversation with for almost 10 years informally. We met in New Haven, I think you were in medical school. I was just being a writer, I guess. Um, and you had just started as an editor at Kill Screen, which was a magazine about video games, which I was like a web editor for, and then we talked about video games for the next decade. <laughs> so I think that's like sort of the ground of our friendship, but that, that followed into Ryan becoming um, an artist who really, I feel like your thinking has always dealt with analyzing structures, particularly power structures that underlie software and digital platforms. And I feel like about four or five years ago, I started to see you really um, developing these software works in which you're sort of arguing with yourself and having the user engage in that argument through the software that you build. And you're often playing with flatness and containers and loops and usually with these platforms that we use without thinking every day, sort of Keynote and the Mac interface and instructional manuals to then show the kind of underlying violence that digital platforms reenact and to help people try and understand how ideological and structural forces actually take place in the most concentrated way through the digital. And so I thought today we could maybe talk through your ideas by looking at the site because you've created a super interesting and challenging website for the Queen's International. And it's the only exhibition website I've wanted to spend time on and read everything on. Um, and you mentioned in conversation with me that it's kind of a deliberate continuation of these ideas you started in this three-part series called for, what was the name of the paper? Art Journal. Art Journal. And it's three parts, in submission, tables of content, and building a table, which is just everybody read. And I thought it would kind of as a launch point for your thinking around censorship as it takes place through platforms. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk through some of the ideas of that and then we can look at the site. Sure. Um, that, <clears throat> that project was basically um, a piece of net art ended by two um, essays for Art Journal, and um, it actually, it, it's, um, the, the last conversation was, it was really apropos because um, you had this real sense of, um, like, I obviously wasn't there, but I, I understand that something was there, um, the way that it's talked about, um, it's like something was actually experienced in space by bodies. Um, and I think that um, as, as someone from a generation who grew up being wired, um, it often feels as though, uh, even though you can, you can spend most of your waking life you know, on the internet and most of your work can be on the internet and on screens, um, that it, it's, it, you still doubt that you exist in some way. And there's something about the, um, the, the platform or the medium or the space now that kind of seems to intensify that feeling. So, um, <clears throat> like when, when I was, just briefly, when, when, I was, when I was growing up, it used to be that uh, you could just dial directly into someone else's computer on a bullet board system, and you knew that what you were typing was maybe something they could also see, or something was happening, was, was connected through your, the, your two screens. Um, but the, the more, um, the, the, this project came about because I was thinking about um, my editor at, at Art Journal was saying you can do any kind of project you want, digital project you want it just has to work in WordPress, which I thought was amazing because like WordPress is very hard to work with. It's just a, it's a blogging platform, um, and so I was I was thinking a lot of the, the feelings and, and thoughts about the project came about um, thinking about like a logistical problem, like how do you actually make something fit on a WordPress blog, and so. Um, Thinking as an artist, like if if you know, I want people on the internet to see my video work. I have to upload that to Vimeo, and then it has to have a Vimeo logo on it. And so I was thinking about like why 
if, if there's a reason why people don't create more platforms, digital platforms for showing their own work on their own terms, uh, to me it's because there's a tech, there's a technical barrier. Um, and but at the same time, uh, we have these tools that are developed for us to use that are predicated on the assumption that they uh, are actually um, more making everything more accessible. But actually, you know, in, in, contra in comparison to like being able to dial into someone's screen, it, it, now it's like you, you drag a file onto uh, you know, a page and it just kind of goes through this really arcane process of reformatting it for you and representing it and churning it out. Um, and that, that feels like something, you're really like going deep into a hole and coming out uh, um, a little more lost. Um, and so, in this, in the, the connection to this website is that you know that that project was built on um, an HTML table, which is just um, a way of formatting X, you know information like data on a, on a web page on an X Y grid, and that seemed easy to fit on WordPress because you can put one piece, uh, embed one piece, and actually literally an iframe on the site. And it's just one piece of code, but the, the thing about a table is that it, it's uh, folding a lot of data into itself. Um, and so uh, that same technique was, was used in this case as well. It, I, you've talked about how the website was, as an artistic project, a way to grapple with the anxiety of an institution framing either you or the artists in the international as well. And you were thinking about how the artists are framed, how you're framed. The ability for artists of color to be opaque or not, this uh, idea of like a neutral center, the engineer, the person who defines the space, who kind of disappears every time you sort of look directly at them. And in putting yourself as the maker of the site, you could create a position from which you make those decisions about how artists are framed. And um, there's a really organic feel to the site. And there's an online visual identity that you've made for each artist. There's an algorithm that maybe if we can, if you want to you know, look through it a bit, um, there's an algorithm that remixes sentences on the site. And so there's a real tense, nice balance between the content within the international and that sort of like organic flow through the site. So I was wondering if you could talk through how you were thinking about issues of censorship and erasure as you make the site and how you were thinking about the artists involved and how to make this a, an artistic project rather than an exhibition website. Yeah, um, well, the, I think the, the sort of, um, the, the sort of very like self-centered impetus was to not want to make a website that felt like a transaction. Um, so I think most websites to me feel that way. And with exhibition websites, it's kind of like this feeling that you're, when you go to the website, uh, you're going to, what you're going to get is whatever you see, um, and that's usually a list of names or a list of themes, and then you're going to click on those things, and then when you click on them, that will open up other things, and then what, what that opened up was apparently what you were looking to get. And there, that kind of like closed loop is, 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 is there, there's something very tedious and disappointing about that. Um, and so I basically wanted to do something that um, you, were, you know, rather than have a directory of artist names, you would just kind of have to encounter these names um, by sort of poking through and finding what was there. But at the same time, um, I don't know, I, my position is, is that I, I, I kind of assumed that, um, like, I don't, this, like, maybe this is gonna come up blunt, but I, I kind of assumed that like everyone would have to be erased like, by, in order to be on this website. Like, there is this erasure that happens to everyone to be on the internet because on the internet you're not you, you're content. And when, it's not just that, you know, you have to be reformatted as content to fit into these boxes, um, but that in order to understand how to begin the process of putting your content into web containers to, to be visualized on a website, you have to first, like, reframe yourself as content and understand what you're trying to um, push out. And so, um, and so I think that, you know, uh, any, any artist on this website, like, they're not, in some sense, they're not themselves, they're not, they don't have, like, they're not their body on the site, but they are their content, and their content is like a body. Um, and for me, um, you know, that, that kind of, 
like artists, you know, work with constraints to make work, and then they they have to um, work with further constraints in order to present that work. And um, I think that um, one of the ways I wanted to show that was to actually render everything as being visually contained in boxes. And so, like, if you look at every artist page, like, everybody's content is is kind of like held in this grid. Um, and but it's kind of like every page is kind of different um, depending on what's there. And there is a kind of um, idea that the amount of content that you have uh, will shape the, the, the boxes around it. So it's, it's basically the more content there is, the bigger the box, and the more that will kind of make the site expand and contract. But the second layer of erasure is that that's also a story about content sort of freely working with and against its container. Um, in reality, it was, you know, it actually took a lot of, like, numerical and arbitrary fine tweaking of numbers in order to make um, everything look organic. Like you said, it's not an organic process at all. It's 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 um, making a system and then fitting everything into it, like, didn't produce something that I wanted to look at. So, um, I think, like, acknowledging, like, my own kind of, like, um, position of power, it was, like, I, I exercised a lot of artistic license, basically, to try to make, to contrive a way that things could look free when in a not free space. And, and this also, like, links in to, like, our conversations that we've been having, and this strain in tech criticism now that is really emerging through people like Fred Turner and Wendy Chen, who is at Brown and just moved to Penn about the history of Silicon Valley, which I feel like we've been also talking about for a long time, but only in recent years have good language for. Um, so when you like, look back at how these interfaces were built and how software was built, there are companies that are created by people who came out of failed communes, where there was a fantasy, which is like goes back to like the Puritan fantasy of starting over, that's embedded into software. It's this idea that you can create a community start over with bodies that are emptied out of difference that we can all start over as like, like models this like XYZ claim. Um, and that's a lot of software and how we interact through software interfaces, digital platforms online is predicated on this idea that we are interacting with each other as if we're all the same, which obviously in the world that is not the case. And there's a really subtle and I'm not sure we have enough time to go through this, but link between how software is built and race and bodies that are out there organized through interfaces and whiteness. You call it the Pandora, you call it the Pandora's box of whiteness, in which through software you can track how we speak to each other and start to identify patterns that now we were talking a couple of times today about how this language of censorship has been co-opted by the alt-right, so where there's a real fundamental difference between real censorship and how um, maybe more radicalized groups define censorship, which is just encountering some sort of like resistance for the first time. <laughs> and so this is kind of this, what is the beauty for me of engineering and software is that you can track all of that, you can track people's logic, you can track how we speak to each other and identify the points where free uh, this free speech debate is in that made in bad faith, or um, system. You can track how systemic violence takes place through systems and is like encoded and then made to seem like objective neutrality. So that's unfortunately a comment, not a question. But I guess I'm thinking that in terms of your own artistic practice, if you under are the coder, you are the person creating this space, and as an artist, how do people escape? or move out of being framed? Do we all need to learn how to code, or do we need to be just aware of how these systems are built around us? Um, I think that uh, I, I really resist, and this comes out of like our shared experience in, in game criticism, but I really resist this idea that everyone should learn how to code, um, and also the idea that anyone playing a game, for example, is somehow an empowered actor in a field, of poss possibility field. Um, I, I don't know that escaping um, 
I don't know that escaping a frame is is um, is possible or desirable. Um, I think it's more important, and, and what I try to exercise in my own practice is to recognize that there is a frame first, um, and because I, I feel that it would be horrifying to think that you were free and, and, and to think that there is no frame there. Um, and so in, in recent work I've tried to material, like, you know, in, in, in a way, like, materialize a feeling of whiteness in digital space, but, but it extends to, to physical space as well. Um, and it, it's important to know, I guess, what you're, what you're dealing with. And so now I feel like, you know, we're in whiteness on their terms, but it, it's that that's that that's the easy target. There there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of like material left over that needs to be put on the table, you know. Um, and so, um, I guess my feeling is that um, it, it it dates back to kind of being racialized in America. And we talked about like when you're born minority in America, you feel as though uh, people are already telling you what content is in your brain. And at that point, um, I feel that, you know, for me, that there, there's kind of like a three-fold branching path that you can take to respond to that. One, one, one path is to somehow affirm that, you know, as like a model minority or as like a, someone who's not, who doesn't want to offer up resistance. And then there's the second path is to like somehow resist that. But, it's, it's easier said than done because it's kind of like saying, well, then you actually knew who you were before, you know, these people started telling you what you were, but it's kind of like a, you know, a chicken egg thing. And so the third thing is to actually try to find a third way, um, uh, given that, that act of framing that you can't get away from. And for me, I think that it, that is kind of like what it means to be American is to kind of like try to like reach through like the slats of this frame and like pick out the pieces that, like just pick out whatever pieces you can and try to put them together and see how well you put them together. Um, uh, and so, um, I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah. Did I, I, I answer this question? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, like, the, I, I like putting up the straw man of do we all need to code because I think that is also offered up as a solution. It was like, if we all learn how to code and we all learn how to build these systems, we'll be able to reify or realize ourselves more fully. And that, on that first page of the website, you have the, this 3D volume that keeps getting co collapsed into this 2D figure and then and it sort of pops out and goes back in. Could you talk about that a little bit as it relates to the theme of that? Of the Oh, yeah, I think that, well, as with any, I feel like, as with many artistic projects, I feel like the, the resonance comes after the fact, so, the, 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 so now I see this as a volume hitting a wall, and, uh, you know, it's a rendering of, uh, yeah, of a 3D volume being flattened out to a wall, but telescoping outward and revealing hidden layers. Um, no, but 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 actually, it's also a screen record. It, it's not a 3D rendering. It's actually a screen recording um, of a, an event happening on my screen in a game engine in real time. And so it is actually uh, a trace of something that happened, which was a thing that I did during an editorial meeting we had, and uh, we made we kind of just like improvised it on the spot, and that's that's how it came to be. But. Um, I think, like, speaking about building systems, uh, I, I definitely, I'm, I, I'm not an artist who's interested in making systems, um, and this is not meant to be a working system. I mean, it, 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 it technically works, but it, it's really meant to, I, like, I, I, I want to build a system to the extent that it feels, um, like, you can feel the presence of a system being there, um, because I'm more interested in, in that sensation of being systematized or schematized. Um, yeah. We've talked a little bit about the over a long time. Like this this focus on abstraction here for you, as that works in your practice to create a metaphor for how racialized bodies or um, non pioneer people or POC artists, like this this double or even like triple sense of self is like a schizophrenic sense of self that you have 
um, being racialized in America, and then put on top of that being in the art world, and then put on top of that moving into these like more and more verified spaces. What I've always really admired is these like kind of elegant distillations that you have in which we can see ourselves like flattened and made full and flattened and made full again. And you've talked, we've talked a bit about like Cuisson, Edward Cuisson has this beautiful essay on the right to opacity and that as a strategy in which you make yourself okay to hide and uh, make yourself visible when you want and make you learn ways to hide. And I think of your piece of software too as a very cognizant of that, like hiding and make, being made visible and having control and authorship and agency over that process. And that when you are constantly aware of how you're being seen, you can use that as a strategic, either a shield or you, know, you can see what someone is thinking about what's inside your head before you even start talking to them or they, they reveal that to you very quickly. I think there's a way like how software can help you distill that and track that. Is there, is there a kind of, if you could sum them up, a way to describe the strategy for artists of color or some of the people that you've been seeing in, in the international team? <laughs> I, think, I think that um, for me, uh, it's important to have a sense of humor about it, which isn't to say that it's a joke, but um, it's, it's a very pointed way to kind of interrupt the self-seriousness of a conversation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of, of, a lot of the, I don't know, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, the sense that like, um, like we were talking about this word censorship and um, it's very easy for a person to now claim that they're being censored because um, there is a kind of, they, they notice a resistance like, you know, on their periphery. And screen space is meant to be a seamless space with, with no friction. Um, in the same way that, you know, when uh, I can be in a conversation, when I'm in a conversation with white people and I say white people, that shuts down the conversation. Or I used to, I had arguments with, uh, like, I would have arguments as a kid with middle-aged guys from the Midwest. And one of them literally said, you know, I said racist. And he said, when that word enters the conversation, I stop. And then the thread stops. And it was like right there on the screen. Um, and so, in a way, I think that it's, um, the, the, there is no kind of um, stopping that. I think it's, it's, it's uh, I'm interested in kind of extending it to the point of absurdity. So it's like there is this, there's, and, and there's also a sense of resignation about it, you know, because like, okay, so we thought of this, like, um, this ticker tape thing as being kind of analogous to an institutional voice, but it's like, it never, it never really, it never really shuts up and it keeps messing it up, uh, you know, it's because it's, it's remixing the text and it's getting everything wrong. Um, and, um, but sometimes it says something really beautiful and poetic, but I think the reason that's endearing is because you know that a person made it. And so, in that sense, it's, I think it increasingly feels like many websites are not made by people whom you trust are people. They're, they're made, you know, they're, they could be made by algorithms, but I don't even mean it that literally. They're, they're made um, under this kind of like ass assumption that, you know, there's content and it needs to be surfaced. And, and so that kind of capitalist logic is, is already like distancing at, at the same time that it's trying to attract you into it. And so speaking of like being opaque, I think that um, it, it matters to me that, you know, you can have content on a website that is hard to find, that, that is actually, it, it's, it's out of sight, uh, it's not easy, you know, it, it can actually be buried, but, but not disappeared. And so when you find that content, you can, you can see that it made me feel that that content is maybe with itself and also with everything that's around it. Um, and that, I guess, is, um, an approach toward content that I would like to, to have. We have one more minute. Can we ask if anyone has questions? Does anyone have any questions?
Hi. Um, so I, I work here. I'm a director of exhibitions, but I had a bit of distance to be an observer of this whole project that beautifully organized by Sophia, the curator sitting here, and her partner curator, Asira. And I know that Ryan, you are a big part of this uh, project, and it, website is not just a website, but it is an uh, organic, uh, integral part of the show. Now, all that uh, discussion that you two had, Nora and Ryan, if un unwittingly someone were to tap into this website, oh, next means international coming up, it has a beautiful website already up, and look into this website, and I had fun myself without really touching into the process of it, when it came out and then looking into it, it was a it was an amazing website to me. But what would you expect uh, unwittingly someone to be into this website? Of all that thoughts and concepts and then and, and the struggle and the devices got into this. Now what would be the most accessibly accessible and available impression that this website gives the impression of being different? And what, what is the expectation and anticipation of the side of the main? I, I actually don't, I don't have much faith that I can hold anyone's attention. And so I'm always making work and building sequences, dangling things that are very easy to, to reach. And so, and, you know, and, and that is one way that I intersect with like sort of conventional web design, which is that you sh information should be accessible, it should be easy, it should be clear what, you know, what like you, your eye can be vectorized and, and it can look at things. For me, for me, it, it, it was important that as soon as you open, and this is, all, this is also has to do with my own attention span, but it's important when I encounter something on a screen that I can immediately click on something. Um, but the, the point where I, 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 I try not to, um, I tried to change something was, was that the thing that you click, clicked on, uh, you, might, you might actually not know where that was going before you clicked on it, and even af directly after. And for me, at least, you know, the more that web design gets codified, the, the slower, actually, the more I feel like is in my way. Like, uh, I, I, like, if I had, if this were just like a directory of names, I would feel that I would have to think about a name that I wanted to, to pick out, and then I would have to aim for that name, and then I would have to go, and then I would feel like I was in some kind of like, you know, like fishing things out of a, out of a stream or something. And so I think that it, it's, yeah, it's important for me that that it can it, it can be open to a kind of like a like sort of these digital pre-conscious impulses, but um, but then reveal you know itself through a kind of layering process afterward. Um, I think, uh, and also uh, you know I, it, it is it, I actually just it, it it I built I I wanted it to be intuitive. I, you know I kind of like I actually made it in a way that is intuitive to me as a gamer. Like as a gamer, I think about how do you navigate a, a virtual, like a 3D space on a screen? And then there are, so I guess I had assumptions about like, well, then you, you would need like a, a, a mini map in one corner and then you would need like, you know, and then there would be like a rendering of, of something and then there would be like metadata around it. And, and so actually it, it also comes from a gaming uh, perspective, but also obviously mistranslated through this extremely archaic HTML um, process. And so I think something with that mistranslation I just kind of assume that it will it will produce something 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 else. 